In this video, I'm going to explore the concept of workshop types and go over the information you might need to know to utilize them to their fullest potential. Keep in mind that throughout this video, I'll be using the default accelerate terminology of workshop. As a reminder, this can be changed by going through your system settings. As a result, you might find that your terminology differs. However, any content I explore should be functionally identical. You can consider workshop types to be a template of your workshops. Workshop types are not the individual instances of your workshops, but they're used to store reoccurring default information that you can use to generate your individual workshop instances. Creating a new workshop type begins by hovering over courses and selecting the workshop types option. Once inside this page, I can then select add new workshop type. You'll find that because of these red asterisks, it's mandatory to put in a workshop name and code, but the rest of these fields are optional. For this example, I'm going to call my workshop name Leadership Skills. For your workshop type code, you might just want to use a somewhat recognizable abbreviation of your workshop name. For example, I might call it L Skills. I can also set an optional ID, set a default price per student, which always can be overridden later, as well as include a short description. Once I'm happy, I'm going to click Submit, and I'll be brought to the next step in the workshop type setup process. The following fields in this section are only related to the online enrollments feature. Changing these fields affects what your WordPress plugin can pull in to display on your website. If you are not using the online enrollments feature, you can safely ignore all of this. Scrolling down brings us to the workshop defaults and settings section. The word default is significant here because while these will always pre-populate when you're creating your workshop instances, you're always free to override any information. As you can see, if I've changed my mind, I can rename the name, change the code and the optional ID within the previous steps. I can set the fees and the rates add any discounts, set the expected students, the duration, default start times, and default trainers. Again, this can always be overrided once you're creating your actual workshop instances. This last section allows you to specify whether or not this workshop should be considered active. It will be set to active by default. I can also link my workshop to a unit by following the prompts. I have the option to set this to display in the bookings calendar, make sure that the web outline is accessible, as well as hide this from non-enrolled students. This option specifies whether or not students are able to view this workshop within their calendar, unless they are enrolled in it. I can also set my default finance code, as well as set some images. Once I'm happy with all these settings, I can click submit to save all this information. That about sums it up for this video on workshop types. You now have a workshop type, which you can use to provide your subsequent workshop instances with some default data to make your life a bit easier. Keep an eye out for the subsequent videos in this series, where we delve into the use of venues and venue contacts with workshop setups. As always, thanks for watching.